welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study at Oxford Bible Church. I'm Pastor Derek Walker, and we are studying the Psalms, and we are presently in the majestic Psalm 22, the kind of Psalm equivalent to Isaiah 53. And uh, we are, because it's such a special Psalm, we're doing this in two parts. This is part two. Um, in fact, the Psalm itself is in two parts, and which totally contrast with each other. The first part is, you might say, uh, of the style of a lament psalm, where the psalmist, or the, it's really talking about Jesus, as we saw last time, it's totally about Jesus. David is the, uh, uh, is the one giving the psalm, but he's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he's prophesying about his greater son, Jesus Christ. And part one is really about his sufferings on the cross. That's what we mostly studied last time. And that's the lament psalm that starts with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's a, it's a beautiful description of the cross. And uh, uh, an amazing prophecy that proves that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, the second part of the psalm, and, and then the psalm suddenly changes. In verse 21, uh, this, it suddenly moves from lament to thanksgiving. And so from, it moves from, you know, uh, travail to triumph. Um, and, and in Psalm 21, it, this is where it really the resurrection happens. And uh, he, he declares, uh, you know, you have heard my prayer. You have answered my prayer. And then it describes all the consequences of the death and resurrection of Christ, not just for Israel, but for the whole world. Not just for that generation, but down all the generations. And, and that's what we'll be focusing on this time. Um, but we're going we're gonna to start by quickly reading through the first part of the psalm, and then we'll, we'll notice the, the, the dramatic change that takes place, uh, that, that, that sudden change. Essentially, in the first part, again, is a picture of Christ suffering on the cross, but at the same time crying out for God to deliver him from his enemies, from death and so forth. And then the second part of the psalm is the answer to that prayer, because God indeed raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. And we're going to see that through his death and resurrection, multitudes of blessings are released upon uh, the people uh, who will come to believe in him. Praise God. And so um, it's uh, interesting that the title of the psalm, let's mention this one more time, the title of the psalm uh, is to the chief musician set to the deer of the dawn, or the hind of the dawn. And, and this, uh, this title is suggestive. Uh, in fact, the Septuagint uh, translates or interprets uh, dawn as help. Uh, so they, it kind of calls it the, the deer of the, 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 the help. What that signifies, I think, is that just as, as it were, help is like light appearing out of darkness. Uh, the dawn, you see, is, is when the light overcomes the darkness. And so this is, uh, was interpreted as a picture of help, of, of salvation. So putting it together, we have this deer that is suffering. And, and in fact, in the psalm, we, he describes himself being attacked by, by lions and bulls and wild oxen and, and, and vicious dogs. Uh, these are the picture of all his his ravenous enemies, and, and yet the psalm also talks about the 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 help that's going to come at dawn, when that, that it's not always going to be darkness, but light is going to come, really at at the resurrection. So it's it's about the suffering of the Messiah, but it's also about God's answering His prayer in a, in a dramatic way, in such a way that the consequences of this deliverance are not just local, but us actually change the whole world. Um, and so 
uh, we won't repeat what we said last time, but we'll read through the psalm, um, and then we're really heading towards verse 21 when there is this big change. So it starts, of course, with, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is the very cry of Jesus from the cross. And when Jesus was saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was referencing the psalm. He was telling us that actually he was in Psalm 22 right now. In other words, he was saying, If you want to understand what I'm going through, uh, my inner thoughts and everything like that, go to Psalm 22. And this was the prayer that he was praying on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So understand that he is totally cut off from God because he's taking our sin. And he is suffering the darkness. And the darkness that came on the earth when he became our sin offering, the darkness came upon the earth and... That was a picture of him being cut off from the light and the fellowship of God, the presence of God. But notice, he is still my God, my God. In other words, he is in covenant with God. He has a relationship with God. You know, sometimes we might feel, for whatever reason, um, we don't feel the presence of God. But that doesn't mean you don't have a relationship with God. That doesn't mean you don't have a covenant with God. But you are not aware of his presence. Well, Jesus was not just lacking the presence of God a bit. He was totally cut off from all the presence of God. That's something that we have never experienced. But because he took the sin of the world on himself, he experienced being totally abandoned by God. But notice, God is still his God. And in 2 Corinthians 5.18, it says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. So don't think that actually <laughs> that, that the Father and the Son were totally kind of separated in that sense. They weren't. They were working together to accomplish the salvation of the world. Anyway, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning or literally roaring, he was roaring in agony at... Not so much at the physical pain, but because he was experiencing being the father turning his back on him, as it were. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. In the first three hours on the cross, it was daytime. And then he says, and in the night season, and I'm not silent. Remember that darkness came upon the earth at midday. That's when he became the sin offering. And he, all your sin was put on Jesus. And it became night. And he prayed through the day. He prayed through the night. He prayed continually to God. You see, he was feeling that pain. And, and in, in our suffering, the thing that we should do, as James 5 says, uh, pray. Pray to God. Give, give it to God and call upon God for his help. And this is what Jesus was doing as, as our example. And then verse 3, But you are wholly enthroned in the praises of Israel. We're going to see one th um, theme in this psalm is the importance of praise. That's going to come out much later. But notice, God is, inhabits the praises of his people. He is enthroned on the praises of Israel. He wants our praises. Because apart from anything else, his praise, as it were, attracts his presence. He is enthroned on our praises. And we, he, he, uh, he moves through those praises. Praise God. And, and I think this means that Jesus knew the answer to that question. Why, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then the answer is because he's holy. And Jesus at that time was our, our sin offering. He was carrying our sin. And therefore, he had to judge that sin on Jesus. And it was the holiness of God expressing the wrath of God on Jesus. That's why Jesus felt that forsakenness. And, and I believe Jesus understood that. 
And then it says, uh, but then he goes back to putting his trust in God, and he bases his trust in God on past experiences, um, not just which we can do. We we can, if we are suffering, if you like, we can look back and say, God, you, and this is uh, this is throughout the Bible, you know, God, you delivered the Israelites in this situation, in this situation, at the Exodus, you did this miracle, that miracle. Maybe you can look back in your own life what God has done, and that becomes a basis for your faith because all these things testify to God's faithfulness. And if God was faithful then, will He not be faithful to you now in your situation? And so this is how Jesus prayed in verse four and five: "Our fathers trusted in you." Notice His humanity. He He unites Himself to to the Israelites of the past. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. And he's saying, I'm trusting in you, God, to deliver me. And of course, God did in the resurrection. And then in verse 6, he talks about how, but I am a worm. Um, I, I just want to point something out. You can check it out yourself as you go through. But he alternates between talking about himself and then about God. For instance, verse 1 is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He, he is lamenting about his own experience. And then he doesn't stay there. Again, it's all right to lament, <laughs> to tell God, you know, you're suffering if you like. But you don't stay there. Then you go back and you focus on God. And notice verse 3, he says, But you, but you God, you are holy, you are great, you are faithful. You know? And, and then he goes back to talking about himself in verse 6. But I am a worm. And I think you know, what that is signifying is that he feels um, totally like a worm, you know, is, is vulnerable, is weak, can, is cr- crushed underfoot, you know, is, is helpless as it were. And he felt like a worm and no man. In other words, he was totally weak and helpless and vulnerable on the cross in his humanity. And moreover than that, people treated him like a worm. It, this is a prophecy of his crucifixion when the people surrounding him would scorn him and mock him and so forth. And this, these, this description now coming up in verse 6 uh, and to 8 uh, is exactly what we see Jesus experience on the cross. I'm a woman, no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They uh, shoot out the lip. <laughs> they shake their heads in disdain and saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. And I, I want you to, to know that this is, although you might say, well, what, what's a bit of mockery, you know, compared to all the other sufferings he had. Uh, I was tempted to think that, but I realized that this is actually the power of evil. This is how Satan tries to work, because although men are saying those words, it's, it's, the, it's the enemy trying to speak through them, because this is an attack on his faith. You see, that's the most um, sensitive part of our of our heart, if you like, is our faith in God, the most precious part. And so what the devil would like to do is speak through circumstances, things like, well, if God really loved you, you wouldn't suffer like this. That, and and what, that, what the devil is doing through the circumstances and through that voice, um, and perhaps through, through people voicing the words of the enemy, he's, he's trying to undermine your faith in God, which is your connection with God. And that's, that's the evil in this mockery. It's not just being nasty, but it, it's behind that is Satan saying, you know, if, if God really loved you, he would have delivered you. And, and therefore, give up your faith in God. That, that's why this was a, you know, an, att- an evil attack on his faith there through these people. Um, let him deliver him since he delights in him. 
if God really delighted in you, he, he would deliver you. And that, and that was an attack on his faith. But notice in verse 9, he, he told, having described his sufferings, he now focuses back on God. But you, but you God, uh, he who took me out of the womb, you made me trust while on my mother's breast. So this actually is interesting. This focuses on Jesus. Some see the virgin birth in this because he's focused on his mother, his human mother, rather than the father. And in, that he was in fellowship with God right from his birth. You know, and um, it's interesting that he was, tr- tr- he, you made me trust while well on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. And this actually speaks of the, um, that this man is not suffering because of his sins. He does not deserve this suffering. In fact, he's been in fellowship with God right from the beginning. And, and who, can, who, who does that speak of? That we can't claim that for ourselves, can we? Only, that's only true of the sinless Messiah, who was born of a virgin who didn't have a sin nature. And, and he's talking about the fact, I've been in fellowship with you, God, all my life, even from my mother's womb. And that's why it was even more terrible that he felt forsaken by God. He'd never experienced that before. And so this, again, is a messianic verse. And and he prays, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. For there is none to help. In other words, I'm, I'm in great danger. Please help me. Nobody else can help me. Only you, God, can help me. That's a good prayer to pray. And then he, he describes, he goes into uh, another lament, which mostly describes his physical torments on the cross. Many bulls have surrounded me, strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. And it, there is a verse in Amos 4.1 that talks about the cows of Bashan, uh, and it, uh, it says that, you know, the unbelieving Israelites were, were like bad cows of Bashan. So this could be a reference to the Israelite leaders. Bashan was an area in the present Golan Heights near Mount Hermon on the east side of the Jordan. Very good rainfall. They had very plush agriculture and so the, the cows and the bulls of Bashan were, you know, prime stock. All right? And so these were well fed and so on. So it could have been the religious leaders who were, you know, um, very, you know, well off and well fed and everything like that. There's an interesting angle as well, which is that Og, king of Bashan in the Old Testament, was the last of the giants. One of the last of the giants, maybe Goliath was the last one, but the giants that were the offspring of um, the angelic intrusion. Uh, There was one that happened before the flood, and there was one that happened after the flood. And it's interesting that um, it said that Og, king of Bashan, his bed was 12 foot long and 6 foot wide. So it gives you an idea of how big he was. And um, it, so these, uh, it, the idea there is that he was a Nephilim, the offspring of, of an angel and man. And, uh, and there is the belief, that certainly in the book of Enoch, that the origin of demons is, uh, is these Nephilim. So it could be a reference, what I'm getting to say in verse 12, that these bulls surrounding him could be all the de- demonic forces also um, tormenting him uh, as, he di- as he dies on the cross. And so then it says uh, the enemies are compared to a lion. And this again could be Satan. Verse 13, they gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. And, and so, and then he describes his physical things, which we pointed out were all very much characteristic of crucifixion. He's describing a man um, that is being executed, and yet crucifixion hadn't been invented uh, until hundreds of years after David wrote this psalm. But he is in the spirit, seeing and feeling what a crucified man experiences. So I'm poured out like water. It's like water being poured out 
on the ground. I'm totally spent. I'm totally exhausted. All my bones are out of joint. And that's something that would happen. The dislocation of the bones uh, as the cross was raised up from, from the ground. Um, my heart is like wax. It's melted within me. A ruptured heart that was confirmed when they, the Roman put the spear through and blood and water came out separately was a sign of a ruptured heart through, uh, through the agony of, of, of his sufferings. And then it says, my strength is dried up like a pot shirt. That's like a piece of broken pottery. Just, just feel like broken, totally, with, with strength. And my tongue clings to my jaws. Total dehydration going on there, which is one result of crucifixion. You have brought me to the dust of death. He's, he's literally on the point of death here. And then verse 16, for dogs have surrounded me. Now the dogs in the Bible are, you know, the Jews would call the ge unclean Gentiles. If they wanted to uh, insult them, they would call them dogs. And, and so this, speak, the dogs, I think, speak of the Romans. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. And of course that is unique to crucifixion as a form of execution. The piercing of the hands and the feet. That's a remarkable prophecy of, of crucifixion done by the dogs, done by the Romans. I can count on my bones, verse 17. They look and stare at me, and that, that shows that he was naked on the cross. He could, he could literally see all his bones, and the people would stare at him. That's, um, you know, a picture of Jesus, of, of humiliation, that Jesus took the sh our shame to clothe us with his honour. I got a little quote on that, if I can find my notes here. Um... Jesus, the first Adam uh, made us naked, so the second Adam became naked, that he might clothe our souls with his righteousness and his glory. He took his shame, our shame, so that we could have his, be clothed in his glory. And so the, this description is of a kind of form of torture, where every member of his body is affected, you know, the, the tongue, the hands, the feet, the heart, you know, the bones, you know, literally it's like a torture rack um, that was going on uh, that exactly describes crucifixion. In fact, we use the word excruciating. All right? That comes from the Latin of um, the, cru the crucifixion. Uh, excruciating, you see. In other words, the worst possible pain you could experience is, is as... A, cru the cruci a crucifixion pain. And so, verse um, 18, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And of course we know that was referenced in all the Gospels as applying to Jesus. And that's a, a very interesting prophecy. Again, it shows that they took his garments away. He was naked there on the cross. And also, it shows that, uh, you know, they, they considered him as a dead thing. You know, he won't need his clothes anymore. So this is definitely describing a man that has been executed in a very humiliating, painful way, according to crucifixion uh, that was invented later. But, he, but now, notice, having described his lament, I, you know, look from his own point of view, again in verse 19, he says, but you, O Lord, but you. He's, he turns it back to God. And he makes his prayer, don't be far from me. In other words, he's feeling forsaken of God, but he's saying, God, come close and save me. Oh, my strength. In other words, and that's, of course, what God did at the resurrection. The strength of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, did draw near and raised him up from the dead. Hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword and my precious life from the power of the dog. Again, 
Of course, he will die, but the effects of that death would not last long. God's going to deliver him from, the, from death, and he's going to deliver him from all his enemies. Verse 21, and here we are getting close to that transition I talked about, where the psalm suddenly changes. Save me, as I said, from the lion's mouth. And then perhaps that is Satan. But so basically, if you're in the mouth of a lion, you're about to die. You know. But save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. So again, this is an appeal to, for deliverance. And now, halfway through this verse, and the, and the different um, the different translations do it differently. But I like the way the King James, the New King James, does it. That's halfway through the verse. Um, it suddenly says suddenly this is the moment of change he's praying to be delivered and suddenly he says you have answered me praise God and, and whether in the, on the cross he is declaring he sees the victory now he, um, and he declares it but basically I, 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 this, is, this is now talking about the resurrection this is now Jesus declaring, you've heard me, you've answered me, praise God. And this is saying, he's been praying to be delivered from the power of death, so now this is him being resurrected from the dead, praising God, you have answered my, you have answered my prayer, praise God. And so... This is the transition point, halfway through verse 21, and it is a prophecy of the resurrection of Christ. And it's interesting how it changes. It, we've seen the travail of the Lord, and now we're going to see the triumph of the Lord. And we're, going, we're part of that. We're going to see the transition from his sufferings to the glories that will follow. Praise God. And... In the first half of the psalm, he's all alone. And even, even God doesn't seem to be with him. But, uh, and he's surrounded by his enemies. But now we're going to see he's no longer alone. Uh, but now he's in the midst of the congregation of his friends. Praise, Praise God. And he is not lamenting anymore. He is giving great thanksgiving and praise. And so it's a dramatic reversal of fortunes, the most dramatic you can imagine, from the terrible suffering to the awesome victory of the second half of the psalm. From the depths of despair to exuberant praise, because praise, God has answered his prayer. The cries for help have now been answered. And what we will see is that the significance of his death and his resurrection has a universal significance, has, a, has an eternal significance. It, it changes the course of the whole world. Not just for Israel, but for the whole, for all the nations, and down all the generations. All right. And so, here we now move into the thanksgiving part of the psalm. He says, you have answered me, verse 21. And then, verse 22. I will declare your name to my brethren. Now, this is wonderful. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Now, that the, when you read that word assembly, in the Greek, uh, that's ecclesia, which is the word for the church. You could be translated, therefore, in the midst of the church, I will praise you. The assembly of all the righteous, that's what the word means, the assembly of the righteous. I will praise you. And it's interesting that the first thing he wants to do when he's risen from the dead is praise the Lord in the assembly. Praise God. We're going to see that in, in this being repeated a bit, but... It is uh, an indication of the importance of worshipping God in the congregation, in the assembly. This is what excited Jesus, the thought that he would be raised from the dead and he will praise God in the midst of the assembly. Remember at Matthew 18.20? 
Jesus, this you could see this is a prophecy of the resurrection, Matthew 18.20, for where two or three are gathered together. So the assembly might be just small, or it might be a big assembly of hundreds or thousands. But he says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Praise God. So Jesus is excited when we gather together in his name. He is in the midst of us. And when we are praising God, he is praising God in the midst. Praise God. Because he he is still a man, as well as being God. And in his humanity, he... He worships and he praises God. And so, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. Now, these verses are quoted in Hebrews chapter 2, which is another proof that uh, it's a messianic psalm. Because the New Testament takes these words and applies them to Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. So let's have a look to see. Uh, and there's a lot of meaning in that word brethren. That, that is a dramatic prophecy, you see. We, we're going to see. This is a new covenant reality. That we are the brethren of Christ. In, in, the, in the full meaning of the word. Um, Hebrews 2, verse 11 and 12. Hebrews 2, verse 11. For both he who sanctifies, that's Christ, and those who are, who are being sanctified, which is us, through the Holy Spirit, are all of one. Now, this could be translated as we are all of one origin. We are all of one womb. We are all of one source, or we are all of one family. For which reason, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. And um, remember, there are scriptures that say that Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. And, and so, what is this saying? This is something new, I believe. This is something new that wasn't in the Old Testament. Um, it, it speaks of the fact that through his death and resurrection, we, will be, we are born again when we believe in him. And we are born again out of the same womb, out of, this, out of his death and resurrection. We are, we are born again, as Peter says, by the, through the resurrection of Christ. And so the same resurrection power goes into our spirit when we're born again. And we become sons of God. We are born again, begotten of God. Hallelujah. And therefore, we are Christ's brethren. Praise God. He's the older brother, but we are his brethren. That's amazing. In other words, he became a man. He's, it, it talks about his humanity, the fact that we are his brethren. It affirms his humanity, his ongoing humanity. And it speaks of his purpose. Why did he come and become a man? It is so that um, we might that he might bring men to God. He might bring us to God. That we might all be born again. That we might be his brethren, you see. He came to bring about a family. A family of God, praise God. So that it's not just him that's, as it were, the son of God. But in him, we are all born again. And we are his brethren. And we are, the, in the, 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 in reality, the family of God. Praise God. And, and so, th- this is what he is praising. This is the consequence of his death and resurrection. That he is not just that he is praising God. But he is doing it in the midst of his brethren. He has br- brought forth a new family. Praise God. Of children of God. Through his work. And who will then join with him in the praises of God. He, what he has accomplished by becoming a man and doing his work is that he has created a, a family who know God and who praise God and who praise God with him. Praise God. So let me just read that again. Hebrews 2.11 For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one origin. 
the death and resur- his death and resurrection, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Hallelujah. Saying, verse 12, Hebrews 2.12, I will, and now he's quoting from Psalm 22, verse 22, I, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. I find that very encouraging. That, that the Lord does want us to assemble together and when so much so that he is there in our midst and when we are praising God, he is praising God. And, and when, when we, the, whether it's the preacher or whoever, is declaring the name of God, Christ is actually declaring his name through, through, the, through us. Praise God by his spirit. And, and so this is a prophecy of the church that, that would come forth the new, from his death and resurrection. Hallelujah. And so, and that we are born again as members of the family of God. And so, verse 22, this is the first consequence of his death and resurrection, is the formation of of a new spiritual family in Christ, born out of that womb. And uh, let me just also point out something interesting here, that that, um, Psalm 22 and Psalm 23 are connected. Psalm 22, we might say, is about the Good Shepherd who dies for the sheep. John 10 talks about the Good Shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, and we saw that in the first part of Psalm 22. Uh, But then Psalm 22 also goes on to describe the Great Shepherd that is risen from the dead, uh, who lives and cares for the sheep and brings them into their full inheritance. We're going to see that in the remaining verses. But also, isn't that the message of Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, who is risen from the dead, who, who leads me into all the blessings of God. And the classic verse here, and this kind of introduces the upcoming section, is Hebrews 13.20. Hebrews 13.20, we talked about the good shepherd who laid his life down from the sheep. Here, in Hebrews 13.20, it talks about the great shepherd who is the resurrected Christ, who brings us into the, the provisions of God. The great shepherd. So Hebrews 13.20, Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, hallelujah, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, this one, this risen Christ, through his resurrection life that he shares with us, he says, verse 21, make you complete. This is his provision. The risen Christ now makes provision for us through the new covenant. Make you complete in every good work to do his will. That's his grace that he gives us to do his will. Working in you what is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And that theme continues in Psalm 23. The great shepherd, the good shepherd, bringing his people into the fullness, abundance of life and blessing. All right. Now, just an interesting touch here. Um, Jesus made another reference to Psalm 22, although this is a bit more subtle, in John 20, verse 17. This is when he appears, first of all, to Mary Madeline. And in John 20, verse 17, he says, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren. Now this is the only time Jesus used this language in the Gospels. Go to my brethren. And this is actually a reference to Psalm 22. That his, as soon as he's risen from the dead, he, by calling them my brethren... He is, in a a subtle way, telling them, he's referencing Psalm 22. He's saying, in other words, just like, if you want to understand what I went through on the cross, go to Psalm 22. If you want to understand now, 
the new reality that's coming into being through my resurrection, go to the second half of Psalm 22. That talks about how he is going to um, uh, declare his name to my brethren. And so the, the initial thing through his death and resurrection is the formation of this family. And of course, his initial brethren were were the, his disciples that, that followed him. But of course, as we come to Christ, more and more people come to Christ, they, they join this new spiritual family. And, and we are uh, his, his brethren. But notice, he says, go to my brethren and tell them, I'm ascending to my father and your father. You see, to my God and your God. It's not just me, but now you are also, you're my brethren. You are in the same family. And you are in that same covenant. Praise God. And so that is a reference, again, to Psalm 22. That he's saying, look, look at Psalm 22 and you'll, you'll learn what the new reality is now. Through my death and resurrection. All right. So God's, it, we see that through, going back to um, Psalm 22, verse 22, Christ's desire is that God would be praised. We're going to see this again and again. In fact, from verse 22 to 32, praise is mentioned in every verse, except one verse that just explains the reason for the praise. So it seems to me that what Christ's, one of Christ's main desires is that we would, that he would bring forth a family that would praise God. Hallelujah. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. His priority is the formation of the church, the assembly. That would, one of its main purposes is to praise God. To praise God corporately together. That's why our corporate worship is so important. And it's important to Jesus. Alright. So, let's continue now into verse 23. Um, again, notice the theme of praise. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. And, and what that is saying is, praise should come from a, a submitted heart. A, a heart that reverences God. Submits to His authority. That's the basis for praise that pleases Him. It, it's talking about the, the believers. The believers are those who fear the Lord. And one thing God wants from us is that we would praise him and then we see in verse 23 the focus is on Israel because first of all the church consisted just of Israelites um, for the first few months it would seem and, and so first of all his brethren were the Israelite believers the disciples and so forth and notice he says all you descendants of Jacob glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. So God, first of all, he reaches out to Israel. The gospel goes first to Israel before going beyond that. And so notice, he is calling Israel, first of all, to praise. Well, we see that first of all in the... Uh, you know, his appearances in the 40 days. He shows himself to over 500 people of his followers. Um, and then, on the day of Pentecost, that gets expanded to thousands and thousands uh, uh, who become believers in Israel and, and so forth. And, and so we see that the beginnings, this was fulfilled in the early church. And then in verse 24, and, and he says, the reason for this praise, what is the reason why people should praise him? For he, God, has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. What's that talking about? It's talking about the first half of the psalm. He has not despised the affliction of the afflicted. Christ was the afflicted one on the cross. Nor has he hidden his face from him. Although it seemed for a few hours on the cross, God had hidden his face from him, yet... 
Gad had not actually rejected Jesus. Uh, but once Jesus had paid the penalty for our sin, praise God, he, he turned back to Jesus. Praise God. And, and he raised him from the dead. He says, God, he has not hidden his face from him, but when he cried to him, he heard. In other words, all those cryings of Jesus on the cross, God did hear them. You know, sometimes we cry and it seems like God isn't hearing us, but he does hear us. And, and of course, although there was a, like a three-day <laughs> delay, if you like, God did hear Jesus' prayers and God did raise him from the dead. But I love that phrase, God did not despise the affliction of the afflicted. In other words, God used that affliction, that suffering of Jesus on the cross, to fulfill his purposes. And God was actually answered Jesus' prayer to be raised from the dead. Praise God. And because of the resurrection of Christ, that is the basis for great praise to go forth. We, we praise God because of his affliction, because of his suffering on the cross, and also because God heard him and God raised him from the dead. And that secures our eternal salvation. So no wonder we praise God for his goodness and his faithfulness. Hallelujah. And in verse 25 he says, My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. Now, this is again emphasizing the, the assembly of God's people, public worship. I, I think he's, he's hinting, perhaps he's hinting there of, the, of, uh, of an increase of the number of people following God, Christ. You know, uh, first of all, he just appeared to the 500 during the 40 days. But, but this is a prophecy. It's going to become a great assembly. Thousands and thousands and millions and millions. And, and as we're going to see, it's going, the gospel is also going to go across the whole world. And, and, and there will be a great assembly of believers as a result of his work. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. Well, here is a very interesting thing now. Uh, it is a picture of a feast coming up. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. All right. Again, those who fear him are, are the believers. And what does this mean? Uh, we, I'm going to explain this a bit from the Hebrew culture. But basically, when he says, I will pay my vows, it means I'm going to keep my promises. I'm going to share the wealth. <laughs> uh, I believe that the essential meaning of this is that through Christ's death, through his blood, he has purchased every blessing for us. He's purchased eternal life for us. And when he says, when the resurrected Christ says, I will pay my vows, I'll do what I promised to God. And when, when he was offering himself on the cross, he was actually offering himself for us. I believe that was his vow. Um, that, that um, you know, in those days, let's say you were in great distress and, and whatever, you would make a vow. And you would say, God, when you bring me through this, I will sacrifice to you in the temple and I will give a gift or whatever it might be. You, you make a vow that you will give glory to God. You will thank God somehow. And, and when I describe it, you'll understand it better. But he's also saying, when Jesus was on the cross, he made that dedication to God, that he would share the wealth. That what he purchased on the cross, he will then distribute to all those who need it. Praise God. He will share all the blessings with those who fear him in the death and resurrection. And, and you'll see this, the meaning of this, when I describe to you what they would do in, in, in those times. Um, what would happen is, let's say again, you, you make a vow. That, that God does something great in your life. Uh, you, you've made a vow. You would go to the temple <coughs> and you would make a thanksgiving offering to God. And... Um, only the fat of that offering would actually be burnt, 
God would get, the, as it were, the best bit, uh, the fat of the offering. Then, the rest of the animal, you would have a, a feast. And you would invite your friends and family, and you would also invite the poor. You'd invite those who, you know, yeah, the poor, you know, other believers. Uh, you might... It might be a passing stranger, even, and and you are, you 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 make this expensive sacrifice, and then you invite people to come and have a feast to eat the main part of, of that animal, and so you share it with family and friends and, and the poor, and this is a picture of a sacrificial feast that prepared by Christ. In fulfilling his vow, he has made this sacrifice of himself, and now he invites all of us, who he calls the poor, which we are, we're needy, we, we need eternal life, we need the blessings, he invites us all to partake of this sacrificial feast. You see? And so that's the fulfilling of his vow, that the sacrificial, um, the sacrifice he has made, he is now going to use that to feed the world, to feed the poor, to feed those who who will come to him, who those who fear him. I think you can see the image now. And likewise, we feed on Christ, who is the bread of life. Uh, and so, I will pay my vows before those who fear him. In other words, that is saying, I will distribute myself, I will distribute all my blessings to those who believe in me. Hallelujah. And uh, there's reference, you can check on this, is sometimes they would have a two-day feast. I think that's Leviticus 7.16. And also, um, in fact, let, let's bring up Deuteronomy 12.17 to 19. Let's just have a look at this reference. Uh, I don't have it in my notes, but it be interesting to see Deuteronomy 12. This is the instructions to the Israelites when they did this. Deuteronomy 12, verse 17. Okay. Notice it talks about, you may not eat within your gates the tithe of your grain or new wine or oil, firstborn of your herd or flock or any of your offerings which you vow, of your free will offerings. Next one, verse 18. But you must eat them before the Lord, your God, in the place where the Lord your God chooses. That's at the temple. And then notice, invite your son, daughter, male servants, female servants, the Levite in your gates, and you will rejoice before the Lord your God um, in all that you... Okay, next verse, 19. Take heed to yourself that you do not forsake the Levite. So it's, it's talking about invite everyone, as it were, to this feast, and they will share in the, the feast of the sacrifice that you you give to God. All right. And I think Leviticus 7.16 talks about this feast could be up to two days, right? This is a proper feast. All right, now we're going to move on to Psalm 22, verse 26, and we're still talking about this feast, all right? And that's the feast we're in now. We, 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 we partake of Christ and his resurrection life through, through faith. And notice it says the poor. And you say, well, that includes you. If, because remember Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. The poor means those who are dependent on God, who are humble before God, who are not proud. All right. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Praise God. In other words, all those who, who, who realize their need for the Lord, they shall, shall be able to partake of this feast and be satisfied. He will meet all our needs. We will be satisfied. Praise God. He is able to save to the uttermost those who, who come to God. And then it says, those who seek him will, will find him and praise the Lord. 
the seekers will become singers, all right? And so they will find joy in the Lord. Uh, and then he, notice he says, let your heart live forever. Part of these blessings are not just temporal blessings, they're eternal blessings. It's talking about eternal life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. If you eat of me, you know, you shall never die. You will have eternal life. And so he's talking about the blessings released through his death and resurrection. He will hold a feast, as it were, and we will be able to come to him and eat and be satisfied. And the result of that should be that we will praise the Lord and that we will have eternal abundant life. Hallelujah. So that's the feast. And then, in verse 27, he says this feast will not just be for the Jews, but it will be for all people to the ends of the earth. And this is a dramatic statement now. Verse 27. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. Praise God. And so, notice, he's, he's saying that the effects of his death and resurrection will not just be for Israel, but they will extend to the nations. And multitudes from the nations will, will turn to him. Hallelujah. And so this is a prophecy, again, of the gospel going to the ends of the earth. Then you can see that this psalm does not apply to David. However great David was, uh, however much he suffered, that David, it simply was not fulfilled by David that through David's suffering in life, somehow the, uh, the whole earth was, was, was uh, turned to God. Uh, this is clearly only true about the Messiah. Let me just point out that in the Old Testament, the conversion of the Gentiles, the worldwide coming of the Gentiles to, to God, is always connected with the Messiah. Uh, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 53, they all talk about this. Remember, the, the blessing of Abraham in Genesis 12 was that through him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And, but then Isaiah particularly makes it clear this will only be accomplished through the Messiah. One of the great proofs that Jesus is the Messiah is that only Jesus, of all the Jewish rabbis, only Jesus can say he did that. Through his death and resurrection, the gospel has indeed gone to all the Gentiles. And again in this verse, verse 27, we have a beautiful picture of true conversion. Notice, he talks about remember, uh, repent, and reverence. First of all, remembrance. Now, remembrance, this is speaking about the fact that man as a whole has forgotten God. All right? He knows there's a God, but to forget, biblically, that means you push that out of the focus of your mind. You, you forget something. You, you put it behind your back. You don't really think about God. And to remember means that, you, that God is now on the forefront of your thinking again. And so that's what the gospel does, first of all. It changes your thinking. You, you, you remember. You, you, your thinking comes into line about God. You, you, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You believe in his death and his resurrection. You, and, and now this is talking about in your mind. You, you have the, you, the world will, will start to, to think rightly again about God. Uh, but there's more involved in true conversion. It says, and turn to the Lord. There has to be a turning of the will. In, in conversion, you turn from going your own way, as it were, trusting in yourself, and you turn to God, and you put your trust in God. There's an, it involves the will. And then he also talks about, and shall, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. So we could call it remembrance, repentance, and reverence. And, and so we turn to God and we worship the Lord. We worship Christ, we, which means we reverence his authority, we submit to his authority. And so this is describing the conversion of the nations. Now, of course, this describes the church age, and particularly it describes the millennium too. Um, the, 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 in the millennium, all the world, 
will will worship Christ. Praise God. And uh, hallelujah. And and uh, by the way, this is. Um, you could compare the, the prodigal son to this, you see. He forgot his father. He went his own way in sin. And then it says he came to his right mind. You see, that he, 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 his thinking became, came back into line. And then he actually um, turned back and he returned to his father. And then he submitted to his father, and he discovered that his father was very gracious to him. Hallelujah. All right. Verse 28. Now, we've talked about the, the gospel going to the world. And verse 28 goes even further. And here it says, For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. And I believe this is a prophecy that as a result of the work of the cross, um, I put it like this, the victory of the cross is the basis for God's future kingdom on the earth. Praise God. We don't often focus on that aspect. But in Revelation 5, uh, God doesn't just have a salvation program, he has a kingdom program. And in the salvation program, he came as the Lamb of God. But in the kingdom program, he's going to be the Lion, who established his kingdom on the earth. And the Lamb is the Lion. And, and he, he is worthy to reign as the Lion, as the King of Kings, because he first of all was the Lamb. And it's through the blood of the Lamb and the new covenant that forms the spiritual basis for the kingdom of God on the earth. And indeed, it's, it's not just that he was made worthy, but when he died with his blood, he didn't just purchase the people of the earth, he, put, he redeemed the earth itself. And that, that means he has the right to establish his kingdom on the earth. Um, praise God. So, he, the kingdom is the Lord and he rules over the nations. I believe it's still saying this is the consequence of this one isolated man's death, suffering for our sins. The consequences of that is the spread of the gospel to the nations, but also the uh, future, the still future, the establishment of his kingdom on the earth. And the, and the fact that the rest of Psalm 22 has been dramatically fulfilled is actually telling us as well that this prophecy will also be fulfilled, that Christ is going to come and he is going to rule over the nations in a manifest way. All right, verse 28, 29 describes this, um, the totality of his kingdom. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. And then it says, all those who go down to the dust shall bow before him. It's a poetic way of saying everyone will come under his sovereignty. From the fat cats, as it were, <laughs> the prosperous of the earth, they will worship him. And, and this is particularly true in the millennium, all right? Uh, but even those who are at their lowest, who are about to go down to the dust, this one way of reading it, somebody who's on close to death, who's, who's in that state, they shall bow before him. So I believe he's saying the whole human race, from the top to the bottom, uh, will have to bow before him. And it's also saying, even he who cannot keep himself alive. Uh, and it also, I suppose, is saying, even those who've died will have to bow before him. So in other words, through his death and resurrection, he will be made Lord of all. From the highest to the lowest. Even those who have died. And isn't that exactly what Philippians 2, verse 8 to 11 says? That at the name of Jesus, because he humbled himself under death, the death of the cross, that at, therefore God will highly exalt him and give him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. See, that's exactly what verse 29 says. Every knee will bow before him. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. 
all mankind, and even the angels, uh, will have, no, that's also in Romans 14, 11, that every knee will bow before Christ. That is applied to Christ in the New Testament. Praise God. So this is, a, this is a, the kingdom of God, established over all. And of course, it doesn't mean that everyone will be saved, but everyone will have to bow before him. If, uh, if you're wise, you will bow before him voluntarily uh, while you were in this life. But even those who have rejected him will ultimately have to bow the knee before him um, because he is Lord. All right. And then we come to the last two verses and, and here we, we see a wonderful picture of the gospel going forth through the church age, through the millennium, through the tribulation, through the millennium. What a great thing. Verse 30. A posterity shall serve him. Or it could be translated, a seed shall serve him. Um, so it's talking about, he's talking about future generations. In these verses, he, it's not just that the gospel will go out to the nations, but it will go down the generations and into the future. But um, a seed shall serve him. Praise God, that's us. We are his seed. We are born again of his seed. And we will serve him. I just have to reference here Isaiah 53 verse 10, which is like a parallel verse. Isaiah 53 verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Not his physical seed, obviously, but his spiritual seed. He will see his seed. He will prolong his days. That's the resurrection. And the pleasure of the Lord, that's you, will prosper in his hand. If you put yourself into the hand of the Lord, uh, you will prosper. He will, you, he will bless you. But notice, he will see his seed. So going back to verse 30, Psalm 22, verse 30, when it says a seed will serve him, I believe it's his seed, those who are born again. His seed, his offspring, if you like, shall serve him. It's talking about a supernatural birth. And then it predicts the preaching of the gospel. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. All right. So in other words, there will be a message. How, how, will, how will the seed serve him? Well, one of the main ways we serve him is by sharing the good news of the gospel. Because a seed will serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord. We, we will declare the work of the Lord. To the next generation. We have to pass on the gospel to the next generation, you see. Uh, this is the Great Commission, isn't it? It will be recounted of the Lord, and then it says, verse 31, they will come. Now this is typical biblical shorthand, I suppose. You're sharing the gospel to the next generation. It says, they will come. They will come what? Well, I think it has to be, they will come to God. They will come to Christ. They will come forth to, to new life. Praise God. They, they will come. They will respond. And declare His righteousness to a people who will be born. And here it says, it, it talks about... Uh, the, the declaration is the declaration of his righteousness. In other words, everything that he has done in righteousness, his, his life, his death, his resurrection. And also, the, the gospel is the declaration of his righteousness in that it's a declaration that he, the righteousness of Christ is now available to you as a free gift. And if you receive that, you will be made righteous Praise Praise, through that. That's Romans um, 1, 16 and 17. This, what a beautiful picture of the, of, the, of the gospel. They will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born. Now that could mean two things. <laughs> right? I think most people would say that simply means there are people.
people who are yet to be born, you know, like us, <laughs> 2,000 years down, yet to be born, but yet they will declare. These future generations, he, he will... He, they haven't been born yet, but the gospel is going to go to them. He will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born. But I, I like to th add in the word, maybe, maybe it's talking about the supernatural birth. They will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born again. In other words, through the gospel, they will be born again. So they... <laughs> I think that, that is uh, possible. So this is a description of the gospel, isn't it? That um, it will be recounted. His, it's a declaration of his righteousness. Down the generations. And as a result of that, people will be born again. And what is the burden? This is the, the, the final thing now. The, what is the burden of this message? That he has done this. And the, the word this is not there. It's simply that he has done. And this word means finished. We could translate it as the gospel is that it is finished. He has done it. He's accomplished it. You see. But just I want to just throw this in here. In 2 Chronicles 4.11, this same word finished is used in people who were working to build the temple. Uh, 2 Chronicles 4.11 Then Huram made the pots and shovels and bowls, so Huram finished, same word, finished doing the work that he was to do for King Solomon for the house of God. So, in the same way, Jesus finished the work to make us into his temple. I would put it that way. Praise God. But this is the gospel, that it is finished. We preach the finished work of Christ. In other words, everything necessary for our salvation has been accomplished by Jesus. It's the finished work of Christ. And isn't it interesting that these are the very words that Jesus proclaimed just before he died? In John 19.13, 1930, when Jesus, Jesus, and it's the sixth saying from the cross, it is finished. Or, to tell us, it is paid in full. Praise God. In other words, I have done a complete work. You don't have to add your works to it because it's a complete work. It's finished. And so it's interesting that some, that Jesus quoted verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he also quoted the last verse of the psalm, It is finished. I have done it. Praise God. And the context of that is, this will be the message that will be proclaimed from generation to generation by the people who believe and serve him. They will proclaim, he's done it. He has done the finished work. Hallelujah. And they will declare his righteousness and people will be born again. So what we see in Psalm 22 then is all aspects of Christ's work. Remember, Christ the Anointed One is the prophet, priest, and the king. We see him as the priest offering up himself for our salvation. We see him as the prophet who declares the name of the Lord in the midst of his people. And we see him as the king who will establish his kingdom on the earth. So we see him as saviour, um, shepherd and a sovereign. Praise God. And it's one of those great psalms. So God bless you. We have completed Psalm 22 and we will continue into Psalm 23, which follows on, it really, from Psalm 22. Amen.